Mm -hmm. So yeah, excellent. So this is maybe a good opportunity also do, to do some uh, publicity. I mean, okay, there are many uh, people of the organizing committee and of the scientific committee here, but like for those that still did not register for the personal conference uh, that we really held. So the school in Barcelona and the, the, the conference in, in Madrid, uh, please subscribe and uh, come to our conference. This would be very nice. But by the way, thank you what time? Until what time is it open, the registration, is it? Uh, I don't have this at the top of my head now, but mm -hmm. I, can, I can look it up. Cedric, um, I seem to remember the, the number of places at Barcelona was somewhat limited, like 100 people or so. Is that, is that still the case? And that is still the case, but there are still open uh, positions. So people, people can still register. I mean, we still okay. do not, not attempt the maximum. Thank you. Okay. So let me share screen. So now you should be able to see my screen. Right. Perfect. It's good. So yeah, so it's 10 o'clock. Uh, sorry, it's 10 o'clock in my hour, not in your in most people's hours. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Nikita, are we ready to, because you want to start the taping, the recording? I think on my screen, it says that it is live on YouTube. It is live on YouTube, but he's sometimes he's also, okay, maybe that means it's recording too, right? I don't know. Let's assume that it's, that's the meaning to you. So, all right, so, well, Let's start then officially. Welcome to today's uh, session of the Global Postal Seminar. We're very pleased to have Cedric Holmes. He's currently at the Ecole Normale Supérieure de Lyon, and he's going to tell us about the singular Weinstein conjecture. Okay, thanks, Louis. Oh. Thanks, thanks a lot for the introduction. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk here, and also, well, thanks for the organizer to the organizers for, as I told you, and uh, Anton, for making it uh, through the pandemic and beyond. Uh, so I hope there will be still some nice talks uh, in this seminar, okay? And so the title of my talk today is on the singular Weinstein conjecture and the existence of escape orbits. And uh, so this is joint work uh, with uh, Eva Miranda from UPC in Barcelona and Daniel Peralta Salas in uh, Madrid. Dice Martin Madrid, okay? And so as the uh, title of the talk says, uh, there will be some contact geometry involved because we'll talk about the, uh, the Weinstein conjecture, okay? And we'll talk about a singular version of this where uh, the good setup to talk about this is actually Jacobi uh, structures. And this is where uh, this talk uh, fits in, 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 the, in the Poisson uh, seminar, okay? So I'll try and give some emphasis on this. Okay, so I'll start off with some motivating example from uh, Celeste Mechanics, okay? Then so, the motivating example will uh, show us where those uh, single law structures appear from, okay? Uh, so let us take uh, the uh, three body problem. So as you see here in the picture, we have uh, three bodies. We have primary, the secondary, and the spacecraft. And um, so, uh, in general, the three body problem, where those bodies are moving in, in the Euclidean three space under the Newton's law of uh, universal gravitation, okay? And so restricted planar uh, circular three body is uh, the following. So we assume here that we have two massive bodies. So the primary and the secondary, you can just think of as uh, the earth and the moon and a, a spacecraft which has negligible mass, okay? And so this is the first assumption. So this is where the, uh, where the word restricted uh, comes into play. Okay, and then planar, uh, we assume that all the motion is happening in the same plane spanned by the motion of the primary and secondary. And uh, last but not least, uh, we assume that the primary and secondary are moving around circles around their center of gravity, okay? And so, as I uh, told you, the motion of the spacecraft is happening in that 
uh, plane that is spanned by the primary and the secondary. So this is the restrictive plane of circle of free body problem. And what we'll be interested in is uh, compute uh, periodic orbits of that spacecraft, okay? So, and to do this, we'll uh, write down the uh, Hamilton's equation for that uh, spacecraft. And uh, this is, can be done as follows. So we rewrite down the potential of this. And uh, so the potential of this is given by one minus mu uh, Q minus Q earth. So this is the position, QE is the position of the earth, okay? Plus mu over Q minus QM, where QM is the position of the moon. And notice that this is a time dependent uh, potential, okay? Uh, because the earth and the moon are moving around the center of gravity, okay? And here mu is just the relative mass, okay? So, um, and this means that the uh, energy uh, is given by the time independent Hamiltonian, which is uh, potential energy uh, plus uh, kinetic energy plus potential energy, okay? And here we're looking at uh, the, the, the phase space. So here the phase space is given by the cotangent bundle of R2, where we take out the collision of the uh, Earth and uh, of the satellite with the Earth and the satellite with the Moon. And so to do uh, contact topology on this, this is not a good Hamiltonian because it's a time dependent Hamiltonian. So it's not a preserved quantity. And, but by the symmetries of this problem, what we can do, we can just uh, change uh, the, uh, the reference frame and we move the reference frame with the uh, motion of the axis of the Earth and the Moon, okay? So by this rotating uh, frame, what we obtain is a time independent Hamiltonian, which writes down as this. So it, it looks exactly the same as, as before, but the only thing that changes is uh, the addition of this, uh, of this term here, okay? Which can be thought as uh, of a magnetic term or uh, like more physically a the Lorentz force actually, okay? And so notice that this is a, a term in a momenta and uh, position, okay? And uh, so it's very uh, well known that this uh, Hamiltonian has five critical points, which are called the Lagrange points, and uh, we just order them with increasing energy. Okay, so those are the crit five critical points of this Hamiltonian. Okay, and what I told you is that we're interested in periodic orbits of this uh, Hamiltonian. Okay, and uh, so classically, let's distinguish between two methods of. Cedric. Uh, yes, yeah, sir. Sure. Sorry, just, just a naive question. So you say five points. In particular, five is an odd number. Is it because one of those points is in the center of mass of the system? Uh, right, I mean, because- right, right, exactly, exactly. So you have, exactly. So you have uh, one at the center of mass, you have uh, uh, two of them on the, on the line spanned by, uh, by uh, um, so uh, symmetric, uh, um, yeah, so one, one is in, uh, at the center of mass, you're right. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay. And so classically, there are two uh, methods uh, to distinguish or to determine priority orbits. Naively, let's say one is uh, using dynamical systems and one is using contact topology, okay? So uh, let us focus on the side of contact topology, okay? So to talk about this, we just talk about uh, uh, we just do a very brief uh, excursion to general symplectic manifolds, okay? So take a symplectic manifold and a hypersurface in a symplectic manifold, okay? Uh, what you can ask for is that there exists a Liouville vector field that is transverse to, uh, to this hypersurface. So what this means is that there exists a vector field who, uh, such that the lead derivative of the symplectic form with this vector field gives us back the symplectic form. So uh, geometrically, what this is, is this uh, symplectic vector field expand, uh, sorry, this, uh, this Liouville vector field expands the symplectic form exponentially. So this is what this, uh, this equation here uh, says. And it's uh, rather easy to show that if you have such a Liouville vector field that is transverse to a given hypersurface, then in fact, the contraction of uh, this vector field with the symplectic form is a one form and it's in fact a contact form, okay? So this gives us a contact form on, on the manifold, okay? Sorry, on the, on the hypersurface, okay? 
And if we additionally ask that this uh, initial uh, hypersurface was given as a regular level set of a Hamiltonian, okay, so a smooth function, okay, then in fact the Hamiltonian dynamics is uh, just a reparameterization of the ref dynamics. In fact. Okay, so now if we're interested in Hamiltonian dynamics on this uh, on this level set, we're just interested in ref dynamics. Okay, so let us now. Uh, see a little bit what kind of results uh, do we have on this uh, for in for those manifolds with red dynamics? Okay. Uh, so the main conjecture here is the Weinstein conjecture that tells us that if we have a closed contact manifold, then there exists at least one periodic wave orbit. So this is the Weinstein conjecture, and even though it's a conjecture, it's known to be true in many cases. So for instance, uh, so I just picked here three, but the literature is much, much longer. So uh, sorry for all the people that I forgot here. Uh, so one case that uh, is classically very well known is when M is what is called overtwisted. Another case is when M is of dimension three. So this is a, a proof by Clifford Tarks in, in 2007. There also results in higher dimensions and there also results on the minimal number, et cetera, okay? So this is just a very vast uh, overview on this conjecture, okay? And the aim now is to apply this conjecture to the setup of, uh, of the restricted planar circular free body problem, okay? And this is something that has been done in uh, back, in, well, 10 years ago, let's say, okay? So the idea is to look at uh, a, a energy level set uh, for energy smaller than the first uh, critical value, okay? So here C is uh, uh, smaller than the first, uh, the energy of the first Lagrange point, okay? And it's easy to see that uh, the, the hypersurface has three uh, connected components, okay? So if you project down to a position space, what those three connected components look like, uh, it's a region around the earth, it's a region around the moon, and then there's one region where uh, the satellite is actually far away from Earth and the Moon. So those are the three uh, connected components, okay? And, um, and so for the time being, we'll just uh, consider the, uh, the uh, connected component, which is actually close to the Earth, okay? Later on, we'll consider like actually the, the, the connected component where we're very, very far away uh, from from the Earth, okay. But uh, for the time being, we just con consider this connected component, okay. So what the authors uh, prove, so the authors Albus, Frauenfeld, Kurt, Patanen, is that in fact uh, you can find a Liouville vector field that is transverse to this hypersurface, okay. And uh, so this Liouville vector field is just uh, the uh, the radial vector field in uh, the position coordinates, okay? And this applies by what we've seen that uh, now this connecting component of, of, the, uh, of the hypersurface is in fact uh, a, contact, uh, a contact manifold, okay? But uh, somehow the uh, Weinstein conjecture doesn't apply because we have, in fact, uh, we have collision of the satellite with uh, the Earth, okay? Um, so this is where uh, Weinstein conjecture does not apply, okay? So this could be the end of the story, but uh, fortunately the story goes on because in fact, what this collision is, it's just a two-body collision. It's just the co a collision between a, the satellite and, uh, and the, the Earth, okay? And this is, uh, can classically be regularized, okay? And what you obtain is in fact, uh, a smooth manifold, and what the authors prove is that this level vector field that we had in this uh, initial uh, um, hypersurface still descends well to this compactification. Okay, so what this means is that uh, we get a compact manifold with a natural uh, contact form on this manifold. Okay, and uh, so uh, by the result, so this. This hypersurface here is of three dimensions. So recall that we want the cotangent bundle of R2 basically. So this is a three dimensional uh, manifold, okay, uh, that is contact. And thus, by the Weinstein conjecture, we have a closed uh, rave orbit, okay. 
So uh, the theorem is that for uh, energy values smaller than the first uh, value of, of the first Lagrange point, we have a closed uh, orbit on that on that regularized uh, level set. Okay, so this is very good, but uh, so kind of like the idea and the motivation now is to try and uh, uh, find, in fact, what are those uh, what are those uh, rib orbits, in fact. So the question that I'd like to ask is, where are those periodic orbits? Okay, so. Uh, because we only find them on the regularized set, okay? Or they may be on the collision set, okay? And uh, of course, we would like to distinguish between those two kinds of orbit. We would like to distinguish between really smooth orbits that exist on the in, uh, on the original manifold, and we would like to uh, distinguish between uh, periodic orbits that go through this uh, collision set. So this is uh, kind of the idea. So the 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 research program is now to keep track of the singularities under this regularization, okay? And try and prove dynamical results for this uh, geometric structures with singularities. And uh, so the answer to these questions, uh, uh, I'm trying to give them with B symplectic and B contact geometry, okay? So let me now show you how this B symplectic and B contact uh, structures appear. And in order to do so, we're going to change a little bit uh, the, pro, uh, the problem. So now we're not going to consider the level set that is actually close to, uh, to the Earth, but what we're going to uh, consider is a level set that is uh, far away from, uh, from the Earth and the Moon. Okay, so uh, what, what we first do, so we change uh, the, 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 the coordinates that we have on the cotangent bundle, we change them to uh, radial coordinates on the position. Okay, so this is here where this R alpha comes into play. And we do a symplectic change of coordinates in the momenta. So this here is just a symplectic change of coordinates. So the, the standard symplectic form here pulls back to the standard symplectic form here. Okay, and what people in celestial mechanics are really interested in is analyzing, in fact, what is happening at infinity. Okay, and so uh, to 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 get a better understanding of what is happening in, at infinity, uh, classically people in elastic mechanics use this McKee change of coordinates. Okay, the McKee change of coordinates, what it does for you, it exchanges the infinity with the origin, so it brings everything that is very far away close to the origin to be able to analyze actually uh, uh, what is going on at infinity. So what you typically would like to study is when is the satellite uh, uh, escaping to infinity, okay? And um, so this chain of corners is given by r equal to two of x squared, okay? And this is not a canonical change of coordinates, okay? So this, uh, the pullback of the symplectic form under this chain of coordinates is in fact, is of course not a symplectic form, okay? But very naively, we just computed, okay? And what we obtain is something of this type here. So what we obtain is that the symplectic uh, form that is not really symplectic form looks as minus four uh, x cubed dx wedge d alpha plus dpr wedge dp alpha. Okay, so and this uh, at, at first sight looks like something cruel. Okay, because you have here like this singularity appearing here, so it's really not a singular. Uh, it's really not a symplectic form. However, away from x equal to zero, you of course have uh, a symplectic. Uh, form. Okay, and the good way of thinking of this uh, this differential form with singularity is in fact to uh, dualize it. Okay, so if you dualize it, what it becomes is uh, something of this type here, minus x cube over four uh, d uh, d. Okay, my mouse is running out of battery. Uh, uh, dx watch d alpha plus dp. Uh, DDPR wedge DDP alpha. Okay, so, and this is just a Poisson structure. Okay, uh, so it's a Poisson structure that, of course, at x equal to zero degenerates. Okay, and, but it's a Poisson structure. So the aim now is to do dynamics on this particular uh, case of Poisson structures that have this uh, type of form and try and do uh, dynamics on those. So this uh, is a little bit the, the, the idea of, of today's talk. Cedric, maybe I'm slightly confused. 
by the expression for omega because somehow coordinates are canonically conjugated to coordinates and momenta are co canonically conjugated to momenta, right, in this formula. Or, or these p's, they, do, they have a different meaning. So you're right. So in, in, this, in this first uh, change of coordinates, what, what this really is, this is a symplectic change of coordinates. So this is, uh, so uh, D, uh, R is conjugated uh, to, 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 to DPR. Okay, to the to the momenta in the R coordinate. Okay, so this is for the formula for the first formula that you have here on the on the on the screen. Okay, but uh, when you do this Mackey change of coordinates, you don't change the momenta, so you just change the position. So this is so here the x coordinate is not conjugate to to. Oh, I, I I understand that, but somehow it, it I, I like so. But do we start with? Uh, dpr of hdr plus dp alpha of hd alpha that, that would be the usual like how i usually picture those coordinate and momenta and here it looks like p is paired with p and q is paired with q of course this is just a matter of notation but just just to know what what uh, okay okay indeed indeed i i'm okay uh, i'm sorry there's a mistake here. there's a typo here you're right you're you're, you're very right so here it should be to, okay, there's a typo here. It should be dx wedge dpr plus d alpha wedge dp alpha. Okay, okay, perfect. Okay. So and then similar so, in, the, so, in the Poisson structure, right? They are similarly, all... similar in the Poisson structure, yeah. So my, I don't have, I don't have a mouse right now because my mouse ran out of battery. <laughs> But like uh, this is exactly what what you say. So there's a typo here. I'm I'm I'm, I'm sorry for this. So uh, you should exchange uh, here basically d alpha with dpr. This is what I'm saying. Okay. And, uh, another question. Um, sure. Why why do you take uh, x squared? Why don't you take say one over x? This is a good question. This is a good question. Uh, I don't have a very good answer to this. <laughs> this is a so this is classically a, a coordinate change that people in celestial mechanics use, okay, to uh, to to study the stability at infinity, okay. But I don't have a very good answer why Makihi in fact introduced this change of coordinates. I'm also quite confused about the two in that change of coordinates. But uh, this is the classical change of coordinates that is everywhere in the literature. Okay, thanks. Okay. Okay, great. So uh, now what we'd like to do, we'd like to do uh, dynamics on those kind of manifolds. So what I'm first uh, doing is I'm giving you a, a, a precise setup where to work on, okay? And so this is what is called B symplectic and B contact geometry, okay? So, uh, now we forget about uh, celestial mechanics, and in fact, what we're going to do, we're going to do a symplectic geometry over a certain Lie algebraid. Okay, so let me explain to you how to construct this Lie algebraid. So, as I told you, B symplectic structures can be seen as symplectic structures mo modeled over a Lie algebraid, which is the B cotangent bundle. And so, this B cotangent bundle is a uh, uh, can be constructed as follows. So uh, we look at vector fields that are tangent to a given hypersurface. So we fix the hypersurface and we look at vector fields that are tangent to that hypersurface, okay? And the B tangent bundle is defined as the vector bundle whose sections are the vector fields that are tangent to this hypersurface, okay? Uh, so uh, I'll give you once more the construction, like maybe a little bit more explicit, okay? So consider a uh, hypersurface Z, okay? And assume that it's a regular, uh, that, that it's a level set of a regular, uh, uh, regular level set of the function F, okay? So this hypersurface Z in this talk will always be uh, called the critical set, okay? And we're looking at uh, uh, vector fields that are tangent to that. So locally around this uh, hypersurface, this those, uh, this set of vector fields is just spanned by f, ddf, ddx1, ddx n minus one, okay? Where, so uh, f here is the defining function for this hypersurface. Uh, z, ddf is the normal vector field to this uh, 
to this um, hypersurface, okay? And uh, so uh, because this is a, uh, a C infinity locally, uh, uh, locally C infinity uh, module, okay? A projective module, you can apply the Swan theorem, okay? And it tells you that there exists a, a bundle, okay? Whose sections are exactly those vector fields, okay? And this, the rank of this bundle has uh, is of rank uh, equal to the dimension of M. Okay, and once you have this bundle, what we do, we just do symplectic geometry over this bundle. Okay, and uh, so to do to do symplectic geometry over this bundle, we just uh, we just copy like the usual uh, construction of differential forms. Okay, so we can take the dual of this bundle and we can take uh, wedges and sections. Okay, so if we take a K wedge and we take of the of the cotangent B cotangent bundle and we take sections of this, we get differential forms. Okay, but of course those won't be smooth differential forms. Okay, but will be differential forms with uh, with some kind of singularities. Okay, and so to show you how those forms look like, they are actually very easy to write down. Okay, because if we have a B form of degree K, okay? It always can be decomposed as alpha wedge DF over F plus beta, okay? Where alpha is a smooth form of degree K minus one and beta is a smooth form of degree K. Okay, so this gives you a very uh, clear understanding of how this uh, differential forms with singularity look like. And um, so now if we'd like to do uh, symplectic geometry, uh, we need a differential, okay? And to define this differential, we just use this decomposition that we have here, okay? Uh, so we just define the differential of omega to be uh, the differential of alpha plus the f plus f plus the differential of beta, okay? Where here on, on alpha and beta, we just have the, 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 the smooth Durham differential. Okay, great. So now we have all the ingredients to do symplectic geometry over this uh, Lie algebraid, okay? And uh, so this is what has been, uh, what the authors Kim and Miranda Peters did uh, uh, eight years ago. Uh, so what they defined is a, a B-symplectic uh, form on an even dimension manifold is a two form, a B2 form, uh, such that the differential of this uh, form is zero and uh, this uh, B form is non-degenerate, okay? So uh, remark here, this differential of course is the differential that we just defined, okay? And non-degeneracy here is of course to be understood as uh, non-degeneracy as a uh, over the, the B tangent bundle, okay? And uh, so what the authors prove in the same paper is that there exists in fact a one-to-one -one, uh, correspondence between B symplectic uh, forms and uh, Poisson structures whose maximum wedge uh, uh, cuts the zero section transversely. Okay. Uh, excuse me. Uh, may I ask a question, please? Sure. Sure. Uh, yes. Uh, well, uh, I was wondering if uh, if you really needed to invoke uh, the Serre Swan theorem, you know, to define the uh, this B tangent bundle. Uh, can one just write down the transition functions, uh, the, the, the exactly. transition functions for, for it. Exactly. Uh, so you can you can you can define it more directly. So for instance, what you can do. So uh, the the easiest case is to assume that uh, that this f is a globally defined function. Okay, and then you can just pick the parts where f is positive, the parts where f is negative. Okay, so you get uh, two connected component. Well, no, not two connected components, but you get. Uh, let's say M positive and M, uh, M negative. Okay, so you take the smooth tangent bundle of those two parts. Okay, and what you need to do, you need to glue those two parts together. Okay, and the way to glue them together is uh, you take this normal vector field that goes from plus to minus, for instance. Okay, and you glue those two back together by the constant diagonal map uh, that actually uh, switches the orientation of this normal vector field as you glue. So this is like a direct construction. Okay. okay, thank you. Okay, so there's no need to, to uh, apply the Swan theorem, but of course, like there are more general setup where it's easier to, to, uh, to, 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 to evoke the Swan theorem. 
Okay. Okay. So um, this is the definition of B-symplectic and B-contact uh, manifold uh, of B-symplectic manifolds. Okay. So now, uh, what is the odd-dimensional equivalent to this? Okay. And well, everybody here in the audience can imagine very well what it is. Okay. Uh, so you take a B form uh, of degree one, okay? And what you ask for is that alpha wedge d alpha to the nth power is nowhere vanishing, okay? So the manifold here is of dimension two n plus one, so it's an odd dimension manifold. And here we ask that alpha wedge d alpha to the nth power is a, a B form of maximal degree, okay? So this is what, what, what this definition here asks for, okay? And one would like to have like a similar equivalence between uh, um, uh, between uh, B-contact B structures and uh, uh, a certain type of Poisson structure, except that this, of course, does not work directly. But like to make this work, one has to evoke what are Jacobi structures. Okay, so let me very briefly remind you what is a Jacobi structure. Okay, a Jacobi structure on a, a manifold M, so there's no condition on, on the dimension. It's just given by a two vector field, by vector field uh, lambda uh, and R, okay, uh, where you ask for uh, two integrability conditions, okay. So the first one is that lambda with the sorry the uh, the, the bracket of lambda with lambda uh, is given by twice lambda which R, okay, and the lead derivative of uh, lambda with respect to R is zero. So those two commute. Okay, so this is what is a Jacobi structure. There's also an uh, associated bracket to Jacobi structures, okay? And so what are the main examples of uh, Jacobi structures, okay? So the first one uh, that I give here is uh, a Poisson structure, in fact, because you can just take lambda to be uh, the bivector field pi of the Poisson structure and R equal to zero, okay? So this means that uh, this condition here uh, then just writes down as the uh, Poisson, uh, uh, Poisson condition, okay? And this condition, of course, is uh, trivially satisfied, okay? So this means that Jacobi uh, structures are a, uh, a particular uh, a generalization of, um, of, um, of, of Poisson structures, okay? But uh, there's one case that in that that a particular case of Jacobi structures that is not covered by uh, Poisson structure. And, and this is uh, there's a context structure. Okay, so if we have a context structure, what you can uh, look at uh, is the following. So as the vector field R, you just take the red vector field associated to the contact form. Okay, and the by uh, vector field you define it as follows. You define it. When you apply uh, lambda to f and g, you, you define it to be the differential of alpha applied to uh, what is called the contact Hamiltonian vector field xf and the contact Hamiltonian vector field xg. So I'm not going to define this, but just to tell you that uh, contact structures are a particular case of Jacobi structure. Okay, great. So, and uh, as I told you, the aim is to uh, uh, to put this B contact forms in bijections of uh, such Jacobi structures. And this can be done. Uh, and what one can show is that uh, a B contact structure uh, is in fact equivalent to a Jacobi structure where you ask that the maximum wedge is in fact transfers to the zero section. Okay, so this is what here is called B Jacobi structure, but the only important thing to remember is this. Uh, this this part here. Okay, so this is quite a lot of information. So let me just put this very uh, uh, geographically on the map. Okay, so the, here's the, the the landscape that we have. So we have uh, symplectic and Poisson. So uh, uh, symplectic is a is a, a particular case of Poisson, and you have B symplectic sitting somewhere in between those two worlds. Okay. And you have Jacobi, which is a generalization of Poisson, but it also englobes contact, okay? And so B contact here is a, a generalization of, uh, uh, of, of contact and lies in between the world of, of Jacobi and, and, and contact structures, okay? Okay, 
So let me uh, now go to the local aspects of uh, B contact uh, forms just to make you feel a little bit what, what those look like. Okay. So um, uh, we just take R3 with uh, uh, the critical set given by Z equal to zero. Okay. And we can define two different contact, B contact forms on, on this manifold. So the first one that we define is dz over z plus x dy. And the second one is dx plus y dz. Okay, so those are just two examples. Okay, and uh, one can easily check that those are B contact forms and uh, you can uh, compute the associated uh, rate vector field. So the rate vector field is given by those two equations. So it's determined by those two equations. Okay. And uh, in fact, that rate vector field has, uh, that we wrote down here, has two mm, very different behaviors because, uh, of course, this rate vector field is a section of uh, the B tangent bundle. Okay, so as a section of the B tangent bundle, it cannot vanish because of this equation here. Okay, but it's a B vector field. So in particular, it's a smooth vector field. Okay, so as a smooth vector field, this uh, rate vector field, in fact, vanishes. Whereas uh, as a smooth vector field, this vector field here does not vanish. Okay, so this really shows that uh, uh, um, the red vector field in fact can vanish, and that the two behaviors are uh, kind of very different. Okay, and similarly, uh, so if you look at the kernel of the contact form, which is called the B contact structure, uh, this kernel uh, as a smooth uh, distribution. Uh, can the rank can in fact change as you move the base point? Okay, so this is just like a, a, sm a small comment, but the vanishing of the red vector field will be very important uh, in a second. Okay, and uh, before moving on, I'm just going to uh, briefly in, uh, give you like a very small result. Uh, so uh, this, as we saw, if we have a, uh, a hypersurface in a symplectic manifold with a transverse level vector field, you get a, a contact manifold, okay? And the only thing that I'm saying here is that this proposition holds in the B setup, okay? So if we take a, a, a hypersurface in a B symplectic manifold that has transverse level vector field, okay, this uh, hypersurface will be of B contact type, okay? And um, so, now for the rest of the talk, now we come to the heart of the talk and it's going to be about dynamics on the contact manifolds, okay? So uh, primarily what we're interested in is to write down the equation of the rep vector field and to, uh, uh, to say something about the dynamics of this vector field. So uh, when I say dynamics of this vector field, I always mean the dynamics when this vector field is viewed as a smooth vector field. So you include, inject this in the, in the space of smooth vector fields, okay? So question, are there always periodic orbits of this red vector field? The answer is, uh, well, uh, on the critical set, there will always be uh, periodic orbits and away from the critical set, uh, you can have uh, examples where there are no periodic orbits, okay? And um, so to explain you this a little bit, let us just uh, take an example. So we take, this B symplectic manifold here. So we take R4 with uh, omega given by this B symplectic form here. Okay. And we look at the three sphere in this manifold. Okay. So uh, it's easy to show that this is in fact a uh, B contact manifold. So there exists a transverse level vector field to this. Okay. And so hence one can compute the, dynam the dynamics of this, uh, of this uh, red vector field. And in fact, on the critical set, what you have is that the rep dynamics is given by this picture here. So the critical set is given by a two sphere sitting in S3, okay? And uh, so you have two singular points, which are the north and the south pole, and you just have rotation around the axis, okay? So this is, this is the dynamics of the rep vector field on the critical set, okay? So in particular, you see that there are always infinitely many periodic, uh, the, uh, sorry, that in this example, there are infinitely many uh, periodic orbits, okay? And um, what we're now going to show is uh, that uh, this is in fact true in general, okay? Is there a question, Dima? 
Um, uh, sorry, yeah, I, I was just, uh, excuse me, I was just wondering uh, uh, which uh, two sphere, but uh, yeah, I think I, yeah, I think I got it. That's, yeah. Okay, so the two spheres, uh, so uh, uh, the critical set here is- X1 one equals zero. So X, X1 equal to zero sitting in S3, exactly. Uh, so may, may I ask uh, uh, another question? Uh, sure. Uh, just take this opportunity, excuse me for interrupting, but the, uh, I, uh, I, uh, the formula that you showed before for, you know, for, uh, 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 for, your, uh, your, for your example, but, you know, with the satellite uh, had a cubic uh, singularity. Exactly. Uh, so uh, uh, is that covered by uh, you know, the, the, the theory that you're... You, 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 can, you can generalize all of this. For the sake of, of simplicity, I, I, I do not mention this here. So everything has singularity one, which is the easiest uh, case. So exponent one, let's say, but you can generalize this. Okay, so there is a theory of these uh, kind of like higher or like yeah. you know, more singular B structures. Uh, yeah. you, you, don't, you don't have transverse intersection anymore, but you have some more general intersection. But. Okay, yeah, just so that I understand. So, so, the, so your example is not actually covered by uh, uh, the theory that you're now uh, discussing. Yes, so you can you can generalize this example as well to to those uh, to those structures. I didn't write it down for the sake of simplicity, but but the similar example works. Okay, uh, thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so the 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 situation that is that we have here, in fact, works always at least in dimension three. Okay, so uh, uh, this is. Uh, uh, we will prove this in, in two uh, steps. Let's say the first proposition is, uh, so if you have a, a B contact uh, form on a three dimensional uh, B manifold, okay, uh, what you can always do, you can always decompose it as U DZ over Z plus beta, where you use a smooth function beta as a smooth uh, one form, okay? And uh, so we saw, uh, uh, we saw that uh, you can always decompose it like this. Okay, and now if you write down the contact condition for this uh, form, what you get is that in fact the smooth two form okay needs to be different from zero. Okay, this is just the contact uh, condition. So the smooth form is u d beta plus beta wedge d u. Okay, so in dimension two, this is just saying that this is in fact symplectic because it's narrow form. Okay, so this is where like the dimension is really important. Okay, and now, if you uh, compute uh, the red vector field, you can just plug in the, the, the restriction of the red vector field to this smooth two form, okay? And what you get is du. So this is a, 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 a computation that I'm omitting here, okay? But what this com uh, computation tells you is that this red vector field is in fact a Hamiltonian vector field on the surface. Okay, and this Hamiltonian function will play a fundamental role in, in, in the following results. So this is why I give it a name here. I call it exceptional Hamiltonian. Okay, so once more, a rib vector field on the, on the surface is just a Hamiltonian vector field with Hamiltonian function, a certain U. Okay, and now uh, what can we do with Ham uh, this Hamiltonian? Well, in fact, you see already from this proposition that the critical point of this Hamiltonian uh, is in uh, correspondence with the uh, with the uh, vanishing point of the red vector field. Okay, and uh, more can be said because. Uh, Patrick, uh, yes. Can I just can you just go back to the, the yeah in this slide? So z is a, a defining function for for the um, the yes. singular locus. Yeah. Is this a, an assumption that you are making about the singular locals or is this uh, this kind of a local statement that then implies things globally? Uh, well, I, for, I just assume that the, the function, the, the, you have a hypersurface in M that is given by a, a local defined function. Locally defined function. function. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so and this Hamiltonian plays an important role namely in this uh, proposition here. So uh, the proposition says that uh, on the three-dimensional B contact manifold, you always have infinitely many periodic orbits uh, on the critical set, assuming that uh, the critical set is closed, okay? And uh, the proof is, uh, is, is very simple. So it holds in, in this slide here. 
So you can write down alpha uh, as we did before, okay? And in fact, uh, u needs to be non-constant on, on the hypersurface, on the surface, okay? Uh, because otherwise the, uh, you would get a, a volume form that is exact on the uh, hyper on the surface, which cannot, which cannot be true. Okay? And uh, as we saw before, uh, the red vector field is just a Hamiltonian vector field. Okay? And uh, because uh, U is non-constant, you have uh, many regular values. Okay? And the regular values of U, so U is a function from the surface to R, the regular values of these functions are uh, circles, okay? And uh, by, uh, by the equation that we had before, by this equation, in fact, what you see is that uh, R is no, non-zero on the level set of U and, uh, and uh, U is contained, the red vector field is, is preserves uh, U. So it's contained in the level set of U. Okay, so in particular, this uh, shows that the reflective field is periodic on uh, the level sets of U. Okay, so this is the proof. It's a, it's a very easy proof that holds in one slide. Okay, so what we showed is that there exists always infinitely many periodic orbits on this critical set. So now, uh, what about periodic orbits away from this critical set? So if you think about like this uh, problem, original problem that we had, so we had this satellite, uh, uh, and the critical set was infinity. So uh, what we now would like to see is in fact, uh, are there periodic orbits away from infinity, okay? And there is bad news, okay? And the bad news is that uh, even in the compact case, there are always examples without any periodic orbits away from the critical set, okay? And the example is the same example as we had before. Okay, so once more, we consider S3 in this p symplectic manifold here. Okay, so I already told you how the dynamics looks on the critical set. Okay, and but now the dynamics away from the critical set looks as follows. So uh, coming from this singularity, you have in fact an orbit that in minus in, uh, uh, that that tends in 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 uh, whose omega limit. Okay, so a time minus infinity limit. Okay tends to this singular point, okay? And if time moves on, you go upwards, okay? And in plus infinity, you hit like the other uh, singular point. So this is a, what in dynamic system is called a heteroclinic orbit, okay? And you have the same picture inside of the two sphere as well, but I didn't depict it uh, here, okay? And all the other orbits, what they are doing, they are spiraling around uh, that two sphere, in fact, okay? And what you can show is that they actually don't close up all the other orbits, okay? So uh, if you do explicit computation, you can show that uh, in fact, uh, there are no uh, close orbits away from uh, the critical set, okay? So the only remarkable orbit, let's say, uh, that you have is this kind of orbit that in plus infinity tends to this point and in minus infinity tends to this point here, okay? And now to uh, have a meaningful conjecture uh, about critical, uh, uh, about periodic orbits uh, away from the critical set, uh, what we decided is to include those kind of orbits in, in the conjecture. So let me give a name to this kind of orbit, okay? So I, uh, I call a singular periodic orbit, a rep orbit that tends in forward and backward time to an equilibrium point of the rep vector field on the left. Okay, so here I depict, uh, depicted Z, okay, the critical hypersurface. I depicted two uh, singular points of the hypersurface, P minus and P plus, okay. And so a gamma is a singular periodic orbit if in, in time uh, minus infinity it tends to uh, P minus and time plus infinity tends to P plus. And gamma is contained away from the critical set. Okay, and for, with, with this definition in mind, what we conjectured is the following. So this is what, is what we call the singular Weinstein conjecture is that if we have a compact B contact manifold, then there exists always either smooth periodic uh, rib orbit away from Z or a singular uh, periodic rib orbit, okay? And uh, so uh, the aim of, uh, of, of this talk is to show you uh, a, 
a semi-local version that, uh, that this uh, conjecture holds, uh, well, that a weak statement of this conjecture holds, okay? So to, to introduce you to this weak statement of this conjecture, uh, I will need like one more uh, definition, okay? Um, so uh, I will talk about uh, not a singular periodic orbits, but escape orbits. So here depicted, there's still uh, the singular periodic orbit, but it will now become clear what is an escape orbit. So let me read you the definition for you. Okay, an escape orbit is a rape orbit, okay, that is contained uh, away from the critical set and uh, that tends in forward or backward time to an equilibrium point. Okay, so this is the definition. The or here is, 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 is the, 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 the difference, okay, to an equilibrium point, okay. So here the equilibrium point is P minus and P plus. So in particular, what we have here is also an escape orbit, okay? But of course you can have things uh, that are escape orbits, but not singular periodic orbits, okay? And let me just show you briefly what this is. So I pr produced this small movie for you. So here, what we're really interested in is in a, in a tubular neighborhood of that, what we're asking for is that there exists a, uh, an orbit that tends to P plus and P minus. And in fact, what, what we forget about is what is happening away from this critical set. So here gamma one is a, an escape orbit of the point P minus and gamma two is an escape orbit of uh, P plus, okay? But you don't ask that those orbits actually match up. So you don't ask that the picture, the global picture look like this, but you're more interested in, in the semi-local picture. So this is what an escape orbit uh, is. Okay, and the main statement of this talk is uh, the following. So this is a theorem that we proved together with uh, Eva and Daniel. And uh, the statement is the following. So given a, a generic metric in the class of asymptotically exact B matrix on, uh, on, on the B manifold MZ, which is three dimensional, okay. Uh, and given a, a any Beltrami vector field on this uh, manifold, which is not identically zero. Okay, this uh, vector field always has at least two plus uh, two plus uh, the first Betty number uh, escape orbits. Okay, so there's a lot of information here that I still didn't explain to you. I didn't explain to you what it means to be asymptotically exact, and I didn't explain to you what is a Beltrami vector field. Okay, and also maybe the notion of genericity should be explained. Okay, so let me go step by step. Okay, so first to uh, talk about this Beltrami vector fields, let us uh, forget about everything that we saw so far. Okay, and let us talk a little bit about hydrodynamics. Okay, so uh, there's one equation in hydrodynamics that is very, very important, and that is the Euler equation. Okay, so the Euler equation models the flow of a fluid that is incompressible, so you cannot compress it, okay, and that is inviscid, which means that the viscosity factor is just zero, so there's no viscosity in that fluid, okay. And the Euler equations are given by those two equations here. So the first one asks that the partial of x with t plus uh, uh, this term here, which is the covariant de derivative of x with respect to x, okay equals minus uh, the gradient of p. So here p is a scalar function, okay? And uh, the divergence uh, of x equal to zero, okay? Uh, of course, here's a, there's a Riemannian uh, metric here involved to define this term here and to, do, uh, and, uh, and to def uh, define this term here that I'm not uh, going to, um, that, I, they are, that I omitted here. Okay, so those are the Euler equations, okay? And those very, I mean, this is the PDE, so uh, let us not talk about PDEs here, but let us talk about like a more geometric version of this equations, okay? And uh, you can formalize this uh, equations very geometrically in a very nice way uh, in the time independent case. So assume that X doesn't depend on time, okay? And uh, when X doesn't depend on time, you can write this equations as, the contraction of d alpha with x equal to minus db, where b is this function here, and uh, the, the divergence of x equal to zero. 
okay? So this equation here is, is, is uh, equivalent to the, uh, the equation divergence of x equal to zero, okay? And uh, the form alpha here is just the contraction of, uh, of the Riemannian metric with x, okay? So this is uh, where this one form comes into play, okay? And so this time-independent uh, case, we're further going to simplify this because we're going to assume that this function b, okay, which is called the Bernoulli function, is in fact uh, is in fact zero. Uh, is, is is constant uh, is called is a constant. Sorry, so that the differential is zero. Okay, and what this equations then tell you is that the second uh, equation just tells you that it's incompressible, so the divergence is zero. Okay, and the second uh, equation, so the contraction of x with d alpha is zero, just tells you that f that x is in fact collinear to the to the curl operator of x. Okay, so what this means is that x twists around. Uh, the axis of x, basically. Okay, so here you see already some uh, some uh, you feel already that there is some contact geometry going to be involved. Okay, and so to make this uh, contact ge geometry uh, clear, let me uh, talk about a proof that was done by Etner and Greist. Okay, um, that uh, that goes as follows. Okay, so let us take a one of those uh, Beltrami vector fields. Okay, so it's a vector field that satisfy this equation here. Okay, so it's co it's uh, collinear. The vector field is collinear to its curl. Okay, and uh, okay, my computer has a weird thing going on here. Okay, okay. And so the uh, Beltrami equation just writes down as d alpha equal f uh, contraction of x with the volume form, okay? And uh, it's easy to check that in fact, alpha watch d alpha is positive, okay? So this follows from the fact that f is positive, okay? And this, uh, this three uh, form can in fact be shown to be positive, okay? And more can be said, in fact, can be said that x is uh, a reparameterization of the ref vector field. Okay, this follows immediately from this equation here because the contraction of uh, the alpha with x is in fact the contraction of x with the contraction of x of the volume form. Okay, so this is clearly zero. Okay, so this means that the uh, x is in the kernel of, of the alpha, so it's by uh, definition just a reparameterization of the ref vector field. Okay, and uh, so this shows you that. Uh, Beltrami vector fields can be seen as red vector fields, okay? And the converse also holds, and this was what Edna and Rice proved, okay? And uh, this statement was proved in uh, terms of uh, B geometry by uh, Cardona Miranda uh, Pedalto Salas, okay? Uh, so I'm not going to prove this, but the proof is uh, adapting the arguments of Edna and Rice to the B setting, okay? So this is one notion that we now explained in the main statement. Uh, so let me give you an example to actually show you how to prove this statement. Okay. So to, to prove this statement, we're going to take an example, which is the two torus times R with this Riemannian metric here. Okay. So this is a, a Riemannian metric for the B tangent bundle. Okay. And uh, we take what are called the ABC vector fields on this manifold. Okay. So those are vector fields that write down as this. Okay, and first computation that you can do, you can check that this is in fact a Beltrami vector field. So it's uh, the vector field is is parallel to its curl operator. Okay, and so by this correspondence that we talked about, it's in fact a red vector field, and the associated B contact form is given by the contraction of the Riemann uh, uh, metric uh, with this vector field. Okay, so this gives us the B contact form. Okay, and now if you uh, remember, uh, so uh, this uh, the red vector field on the critical set is just a Hamiltonian vector field. Okay, and what is uh, now what is this Hamiltonian function? This Hamiltonian function was given by you, and it's very easy to to see that in fact if you plug in this vector field x in the Riemannian metric, the the function u is determined by c times sinus of y plus cosine of b cosine of x. So this is the Hamiltonian function. And now you just come start computing things, okay? And what you see is that in fact 
this function is an eigenfunction of the Laplacian of the metric uh, uh, induced on, on the two torus. Okay. And you may say this is a coincidence. So it's an eigenfunction of the Laplacian. Okay. Uh, but in fact, it's not a coincidence, this, okay? So what is happening in this example is something that is ha actually happening in general, okay? So if you take uh, a metric that looks like this, so it's a, a Riemannian metric on uh, the B tangent bundle that writes down as dz over a squared over, uh, over z squared plus the pullback of a smooth metric on the critical set, okay? So this is what we called in a, asymptotically the exact B metric. What you can prove is that uh, Beltrami vector field actually, so uh, the Beltrami vector field gives rise to uh, a smooth function, uh, which is the Hamiltonian associated to the rep dynamics on the critical set, okay? And what you can prove is that it's uh, an eigenfunction of the Laplacian of this metric, okay? And the proof is basically uh, formalizing this idea that we just saw in the example. So you take this uh, contraction of the Riemannian metric, which gives you one form, okay? And this term that is in front of the, of the singular uh, term of the, of the B-contact form, okay? Is, gives you the exceptional Ham uh, Hamiltonian, okay? And then you can do an explicit uh, computation, a direct computation uh, that tells you that in fact, uh, this function is an eigenfunction of the Laplacian. Okay, and the good thing about eigenfunctions of the Laplacian is that uh, much is known about this eigenfunctions, okay? So in particular, uh, this is a very classical theorem by Karen Uhlenbeck by in, in 76 that tells you that uh, generically a Laplacian uh, satisfies those three uh, properties. So first one is the spectrum is simple, okay? So uh, the eigenvalues have multiplicity one, okay? And uh, the zero set uh, of those eigenfunctions is a regular level set, okay? And third is that uh, all uh, the, those uh, eigenfunctions are in fact Morse functions, okay? So generically what, you, what, what we get from this is that in fact this exception Hamiltonian is a Morse function, for instance, and its, eigenfunction, uh, its eigenfunctions are in fact regular. And this is very handy because now uh, we can prove the main statement. So I'll just finish in, in three minutes, let's say. Uh, so let me recall the main statement. So the statement is that you take a, a metric that is of that uh, type that we saw before, okay? And you take a B Beltrami vector field on, on the three manifold, okay? And now we would like to see that there exists uh, two plus the first party number of Z escape orbits, okay? Now we just put the puzzle together, okay? So to put the puzzle together, we just uh, do what I, what I told you in the previous uh, propositions. So we take this B Beltrami vector field, okay? We plug it in, in the metric, okay? This gives us the B contact form, okay? And uh, the term that is in front of the DZ of a Z is in fact the, the Z coordinate of this, uh, this B uh, Beltrami vector field. And uh, by the previous uh, proposition, this function is just an eigenfunction of the Laplacian. So hence by the, uh, uh, by the, the statement of Karen Ullenbeck, you know that H is a Morse function and zero is a regular value, okay? And also uh, something that we noted is that in fact, the, the zeros of, uh, of, of X are just given by the critical point of, of H. Okay, and now what you can do, you can just do local analysis around uh, the, the critical points of this Hamiltonian, okay? Uh, so this is what I wrote down here. I mean, I'm, I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to be too precise here, but you can do local analysis to show that uh, there exists in fact transit invariant manifolds of dimension one or two that are coming out of the critical set, okay? So what this proves to you is that there exists a uh, one dimension manifold that is actually leaving the critical set. And this gives us exactly uh, the escape orbits, okay? So uh, this is everything that I wanted to tell you. I have one last slide, but this is, I'm running over time, out of time. So let me just uh, give to you like a little bit the references that I talked uh, about today. And thanks a lot for your attention.
Well, thanks a lot, Cedric. So let's thank Cedric for the talk. Thanks a lot. And let's open the floor for questions or comments. Yeah, Dima. Uh, hello. Um, hello. Um, yeah. So, um, uh, 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 so, so uh, what about the uh, the, 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 uh, the singular or like cubic uh, B structures um, that are relevant to uh, to the application you you have in mind? Uh, so, are there? I mean, does the, 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 the fact that uh, that that you have like this this deeper singularity uh, change uh, you know the topology uh, oh. and the, and the, the statement of the conjecture and uh, well the part that you can prove oh, everything holds like everything that I I talked about today also holds for B three so uh, like if if you put a three over all the Bs that I that are in the talk you you still have a valid statement you still have true statements yeah. And, uh, and then may I ask about uh, um, uh, the stability of uh, you know those closed orbits. I mean, is anything known about that? You know, I mean, in view of the fact that you're interested in you know, space exploration, I and mean, that's yeah, this is a good point. Um, how stable are those orbits that we find? Um, so there is. Um, for the escape orbits, there is definitely hope for uh, for for stability. Okay, because uh, it, it, at least for some of them, because uh, well, I guess for all of them. Okay, so one thing that I didn't tell you here is, of course, like where does the uh, uh, the 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 statement of the Betty number here comes from. Okay, so the statement of the Betty number just comes because we have a Morse function. And what we're actually interested in is uh, the critical points of this Morse function. Okay, and uh, the the um, so to each critical point of, of the Morse function, we get one of those orbits. Okay, this is what I showed to you. Okay, okay. and the number of of Morse uh, of critical points of this Morse function is in fact bounded below uh, by the by this number, okay, because you have maxima minima and you have uh, at least uh, uh, the first petty number of uh, index one critical points in this Morse function. Okay, so this is the lower bound on, 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 on this, uh, on, on, on the Morse function. So I see. Okay, and uh, so for the, the point is that for this escape orbit, uh, I, 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 I haven't thought about this, but uh, I guess that the proof should uh, be really stable proof, okay? Because um, because we're also just looking at a semi-local statement, in fact. So uh, maybe for like local statements, like the global, uh, the stability is much more like a subtle subtle uh, matter, okay? But uh, let's say like from from a point of view of uh, a space exploration, uh, let's say okay, this is a big word, but uh, from a point of view. Uh, those escape orbits are, are interesting because it's it really orbits where the satellite actually escapes to infinity. Okay. So this, this is something that you would want to prevent, I suppose. Or, or... This is this is this is something that you would prevent. Okay, but like if 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 you have them, uh, you know you you know where you know where they are actually. So I mean, in in, in a way, like okay, like of course, like this is uh, uh, very far from. Uh, from precise uh, uh, engine uh, mechanics, uh, space mechanics, let's say. But if you know where they are, you can you can try and avoid them in like, practical uh, applications, let's say. So, uh, uh, so, so there is no. Uh, is there a statement uh, uh, you know that would guarantee, or, or you know, under what conditions uh, could you guarantee the existence of uh, you know? Uh, of a closed orbit away from uh, the singular uh, locus. Yeah, so we have statements about this. Um, so we have statements uh, that, in fact, there exists what is called an overtwisted disk away from those uh, from this uh, critical set. Okay, so this is very much in the light of uh, Hofer's proof 
of uh, of existence of uh, closed rib orbits in in the presence of overtwisted uh, contact structures. Okay, um, so this is a a condition, but we need some extra conditions uh, on the contact structure uh, uh, on the contact form close to uh, close to the critical set in fact. So uh, to avoid uh, compactness issues. Okay, so we have conditions, but it's like, uh, um, uh, in a certain sense, unsatisfactory conditions. Okay, from from a from a point of view of of, of really uh, uh, applications, this is not those are not good conditions. Let's say okay, but she. Uh, and by the way, uh, I we mentioned it in the beginning. I might have missed. So, what, what's the dimension of uh, of the contact manifold from uh, you know from the satellite example? Three dimensional. It, it is three. So the whole computer. Yeah, is yeah. because we're working we're working in in the cotangent bundle of of R two, but this is because of our simplifying assumptions. So, for instance, what we what we assume is that uh, that the motion is happening, in fact, in uh, in the plane spanned by the Earth and the Moon, okay. Uh, so uh, this means that the configuration space is the cotangent bundle of R two, okay. So if you look at the hypersurface in uh, in that four dimension manifold, we get something. Right. So if you look at there is uh, work that has been done in the the spatial case, for instance. So you uh, take away this assumption that the satellite is moving in the in the uh, plane spanned by the Earth and the Moon. So this is called uh, the restricted plan, uh, the restricted spa spa special spatial, sorry, uh, circular three-body problem. You can still prove the same result, okay? But of course, then you have something uh, five-dimensional, and you cannot apply Weinstein conjecture because in that uh, case, it's it's not it's not proved to be true yet. Uh, it's a conjecture, not a theorem. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for the yeah. detail. Thank you very much for all your response and, uh, and the very nice talk. Thank you. Well. Well, are there other questions? So the, um, can I ask you maybe one thing? These asymptotically exact B metrics, do they always exist or is there some assumption there? No, they always, they always exist. Uh, I mean, because it's, okay, let me go back to the, to the definition. They always exist because it's sufficient to just take a metric on, on, uh, on, on the critical set on the zero locus. Okay, so you take a, a smooth metric there. Okay, you take uh, this defining function z, which gives you this this part here, and you you pull this uh, this this uh, this this metric metric back by 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 this trivialization t. Right, but but so again, z is you are assuming z defined again by a function. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then when you have uh, these um, singular orbits, so coming out of, a, of an equilibrium point in, the, in, in Z, is there, because of these assumptions that you are making on these, um, on these dynamics, is there something you can say about this equilibrium? The fact that there is an orbit coming out of it, does it imply something about this equilibrium? Yeah, yeah, so in, in well, I mean, in this proof, in fact, like this is something that we didn't write down. Um, I mean, in terms of stability of the equilibrium, if whether it's... Um, so for instance, what you can prove is that uh, in, so when the genus of the, of the critical set is, um, is not zero, so you're not in a, in a sphere, so it's not a sphere, the critical set. In fact, what you get is that this uh, the critical uh, points of index one. Uh, what you have is uh, in fact a, uh, a saddle point. So what you can actually show is that you have a, a, a one parametric family of periodic orbits, okay, that go in fact to this uh, critical point. So you have to imagine it's a one parametric family where the 
for the orbit shrink and, and gets to the, the point. So you, you do have some information about the, uh, the dynamics in, in, a, in, a, in a naval. Mm -hmm. But this is something that we realized after, after, the, after the paper got published. So, so it's, not, it's not written as such in the paper and I think it, it should, should have been. But, yeah. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Wei. All right. Is there other questions for Cedric? Okay, if not, let's thank Cedric once more. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for joining in. And um, I guess we'll be meeting next week again. Is it the regular schedule, the Western or the Eastern schedule? I, I lost track of it. Yeah, that's the regular schedule. It's a regular schedule. All right. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I hope to see you people there then. All right. Take Bye. care. Bye. Thank you for the talk. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.